Hello fellow audio nerds, I'm Steph and this is Major Hi-Fi. About six months ago I got a chance to listen to the great OGH4 and it had such a really beautiful and aesthetically pleasing sound so that this week when I got a chance to listen to the GH3 I was super intrigued by it and curious how it would sound. It's the GH4's on-ear sibling and um, yeah so how does this one sound and is it worth the money? Let's go back in time, I'll share with you my first impressions, and then I'll meet you right back here for my overall thoughts. Alright, here we go. Oh, hey, Steph here. Before getting started into the review, I just want to say a quick thing. If you like this review, and you find it really helpful, please feel free to give it a thumbs up and to subscribe to the channel. Uh, we definitely want to try and grow a little bit, so definitely want to hear your feedback as well. So let us know what you think in the comments down below. Alright, thanks. I'll see you in the review. Hey there, welcome to my place. So today I have with me the Grado GH3 Limited Edition. So let's see what's inside the box here. Alright, so I shall see, it is an extremely simple package, um, so it comes with the headphones. It does come with a 3.5 to 6.35 millimeter uh, adapter, but I don't have one in this box because it's a demo. Um, and then just some documentation about the headphones themselves. But yeah, let's take a closer look at the design of these. Just like other Grados um, in the Heritage line, you know, you've got this really thin headband, very lightweight. It's coated in leather. Um, it attaches to this kind of plastic piece here, which attaches to this metal extender, um, which then attaches to the yokes. Um, and it's a really simple head headband design, and it is extremely lightweight. And especially because, you know, these are kind of smaller headphones here. Hi, Bobo. <laughs> um, there's a, this very light clamping force. It's not overly tight. It's not, um, it feels very comfortable actually on the head. Um, you don't really need padding because there's nothing that's really like holding it down on the head. Um, it just is very light and airy feeling. In terms of flexibility, it's a little bit flexible uh, here, so I think it will work for a wide variety of heads. I have a kind of small head and yeah, in the smallest setting, it's like perfect. Um, fits really well on my head. So I think it'll work for a wide variety of head shapes and sizes. As for the ear cups, you'll notice that they're very slender. They're um, this kind of like low profile kind of design here, uh, by design actually. And this wood is so pretty. Um, I love the color of it. This is Norwegian pine. Um, it's very lightweight and it just, has a really attractive look to it. You can see kind of the grains of the wood on the on the ear cup here, and then burnt into those is says um, you know Grado Heritage Series GH3. Um, so it kind of has that retro kind of look to it as well. Um, and then of course you know the just like all other the Grado headphones, um, they're open back. So there is this kind of like little metal grill here. You can see the drivers on the inside. So it's just kind of a cool um, design, has this retro kind of look to it. Now Grado says that Norwegian pine has special sound characteristics. And I did listen to the GH4 before and I really enjoyed the sound of it. So I am excited to listen to these. Um, but before doing that, let's go into some other details here. As for the actual ear pad, um, now like others in the Grado world, um, this is just a foam pad. Uh, it actually feels really nice and soft, but it's not coated in anything. Um, and it does cover, because these are sort of like on-ear headphones, they cover the entire surface of the ear cup. And so, um, but because of how soft that foam feels, they're actually really comfortable and Usually on-ear headphones to me are not super comfortable. Um, it just feels like too much pressure on parts of the ears, but these are very comfortable. Um, that, that soft foam and just the lightness of the ear cups in general kind of give it that more comfortable feel. Now, as for the cable here, um, there wasn't a whole lot of information on the site um, about it, but I think it just follows the same kind of design as the others in the Heritage series, which is, um, you know, it's this E-series eight conductor cable um, made of uh, UPLC oxygen-free copper. 
It's not my favorite cable because the cable is fixed to the ear cup, so it is soldered directly in there, so you can't remove it. If it breaks, you gotta fix, you gotta either get it repaired or um, you can't just like interchange the cable. Um, and it's also a little bit bulky just in terms of like, you know, the thickness of the, the gauge of the cable. But that said, it is, you know, a nice length. It's a manageable length. It wraps up really easily here. Um, it's it's a good cable and a durable one as well. So I think, you know, all in all, it's like you know what you're getting when you get a Grado headphone. Um, this part of the, the cable being connected, um, the kind of characteristics of it, you know that you're getting that. So um, it is a good cable. And lastly, um, as for the drivers, also same kind of situation where not a whole lot of information on the site about the drivers in particular, but I think it's just, you know, the heritage driver basically. So it's a 44 millimeter dynamic driver. You can see it right through the ear cups and you know that this driver has been, you know, has been in the Grado world for years and years and years and has done great things for them. So um, I think the driver kind of speaks for itself in that way too. So yeah, let's get into the sound of these because I'm excited to hear them. All right, I was just listening to the song I'm, Ca I'm Callin' by Tennis, and the kick drum felt tight and punchy. It definitely felt a little bit elevated in the mix, and also um, a very kind of particular part of the kick drum felt elevated. Um, kind of the fundamental of that drum just felt a little bit louder in the mix. It sort of covered up some of the harmonics, so it didn't sound very like super realistic sounding, um, but it did have a lot of nice punchiness that worked well with the bass guitar as well. Um, there was good separation and spaciousness around it. All right, I was just listening to the song Jackie and Wilson by Hosier, and the vocal definitely sat a little bit forward. I could hear a lot of emphasis in the face, in the throat of the voice, and also in the electric guitar the kind of distorted part of it, the kind of crunchier distortion part of it sat a little bit louder in the mix too, had a bit of emphasis. And this to me kind of gave it kind of this fun retro sound. It wasn't super realistic sounding, but it gave those guitars just kind of that extra little like, I don't know, kind of a, you could really hear the texture of the distortion in that guitar. And I liked that uh, for this song. Now the middle part of the mid range here, the guitars, uh, it felt a little bit like smaller, thinner um, than usual, but it sort of regained some of that weight because the bass guitar had a little bit of emphasis too. Um, so that kind of emphasis in the low mids kind of helped to fill it out. And when you know you get to the chorus and the background vocals come in and the guitars get all wide and stuff, um, that sort of bass guitar in the middle kind of holding it down and having that em extra emphasis really helped carry the weight um, of the song in that part and kind of let the let the other instruments do what they wanted to do movement wise. All right, I was just listening to the song Fever by Ray Charles featuring Natalie Cole and the air of the vocals, the finger snaps, the cymbals all kind of sat a little bit louder uh, in the mix than usual, sat a little bit forward in the mix and um, what I found was that there's sort of something interesting going on. The the finger snaps, like the texture of the finger snaps, for example, had really good separation from more of like the kind of extension and the airiness of the cymbals. Um, the cymbals still had their own texture for sure, but it just like there's kind of an interesting sense of separation between those those two instruments than I normally uh, than normally comes across. And yeah, the texture and the air and the kind of extension you get from this. Um, it's really pretty sounding and aesthetically pleasing. It gives those cymbals extra life. It gives something to the vocals too, for sure, uh, and is emotionally impactful. And yeah, like kind of like the rest of the sound signature, it's not super realistic sounding, but it is really aesthetically pleasing and works for this song as well. All right, I was just listening to the song 1919 by Terry Lynn Carrington. And um, yeah, the, p the piano in the song is recorded in stereo, so the lower notes kind of play on the left, um, the higher notes kind of play on the right. And in this song, it really kind of came through in a really nice nuanced way. There was spaciousness around those notes and they felt 
like they were placed in a really specific way with these headphones. Um, there's kind of that sense of extension there with it. Uh, the bass guitar definitely felt, felt like it was a little bit further back in space than the pianos and the drums after that. So there's nuance in the depth um, with these. And then as for the height, um, there's something kind of interesting because there is really great contrast in the height. Um, but the piano hammers, maybe there's like some interesting emphasis going on in the frequency response, but the piano hammers were sitting a little bit higher than they usually do um, to my ears. But there still was really good separation um, between, you know, the cymbals up above and then, you know, obviously the bass down below. But yeah, a lot of interesting stuff going on with these headphones. They're super fun. And anyway, I will continue listening throughout the week and uh, follow up with my analysis back at the major hi-fi office. All right, I'll see you there. Overall, the low frequencies of the GH3 are tight and punchy. They have kind of this fun feeling of dynamic expression to them. And there is a nice feeling of spaciousness and separation around the low end. I did feel a little bit of a boost around the fundamental of many kick drums and kind of seemed like around 60 hertz. And then another boost around what sounded like 100 hertz. Now, as a result, it gave the low end a nice feeling of energy and power. It wasn't overpowering, but just kind of hat came through with that feeling of just uh, added kind of like punch. However, it also kind of gave the low end a certain character, a shape. Um, one that wasn't super neutral or realistic sounding, but one that was fun and aesthetically pleasing. The middle frequencies of the GH3 had a nice feeling of energy and articulation, and it definitely had character. Um, it sort of brought to life certain pieces of the mix in a way that was really fun. So for example, there was a boost in the low mids around what sounded like 200 hertz, and this sort of gave a nice feeling of foundational um, energy to the mixes as a whole. Um, kind of brought basses a little bit fatter, brought back kind of this feeling of like thickness to electric guitars because in comparison the middle part of the mid-range is a little bit quieter there are, there is a boost in the high mids and this kind of gives you you know lots of articulation kind of brings some snaps out of drums and things like that attacks of strings um, but there was a cut around one kilohertz. And to me what this did is it really created a lot of separation between instruments that are more purely in the middle part of the mid-range from those in the high mids. So in in short, the, um, the middle part of the mid-range here, um, the mid-range in general has a feeling of character. It's not super realistic. So if that's what you're looking for, these really won't be the ones for you. But if you like kind of that smiley face mid-range that um, has some nice articulation, but has that kind of foundational support, then you might really like these. Now, the high frequencies of the GH3 had extension and life. I noticed a boost around in the upper treble around what sounded like a nine kilohertz. And what this did was really kind of bring forward the texture of percussion, of cymbals, of strings, of the voice. Um, and as a result, it sort of contributed to the overall emotional impact of those instruments into my ear. Um, I noticed another boost in the upper octave around 12 kilohertz, and this just added the sense of kind of lift to everything um, and really kind of brought out some of the details in that airiness uh, that you want from vocals and from uh, cymbals and stuff like that. Now, the high frequencies were actually pretty interesting because there were some other cuts in that, um, in the, across the high frequency response that gave this headphone some character up there. But there was another cut around 10 kilohertz. And it was really interesting because it really created a nice feeling of separation between instruments that were more like uh, full and chunky or um, attacky uh, in the lower treble. Um, it gave those separation from those that had more of a sense of airiness to them. So there's this kind of cool thing that happened where it gives you this kind of separation and spaciousness um, while also kind of giving it character. But again, if you are looking for something that's more flat, these really won't be the ones for you. But for those of you that like a character to your headphone, and I think it's a very aesthetically pleasing high end um, that can really bring certain mixes to life in a cool way. Now the sound stage of the GH3 had a really nice feeling of extension and spaciousness in all three dimensions really. 
Um, but I think that compared to something like the GH4, to me the GH4 actually did this a little bit better than the GH3. Um, but it was a really, there was a lot of similarities in the way that the soundstage came across between these two headphones. Um, so for example, it was really um, shaped in, a lot by the way the frequency response came through. So for example, in terms of the sense of height, the high frequency extension really gave it nice length in the top. Um, the solid low end really kind of gave it that extra length. Um, but there was a higher concentration of information, um, a little bit higher in that vertical domain because of the way the high mids sort of sat. Likewise, as for the feeling of width, the width was really nice. And I actually think that the solidity in, of the base of the low mids and the low end really kind of helped to keep things together, giving the sparklier, more kind of high frequency stuff on the sides, more room to kind of play and dance out there while keeping that center really solid. And there was good nuance between those kind of extremes there. And then as for the feeling of depth, I thought I was very impressed with the depth of these headphones, um, but it was very interesting because like I was sort of saying, um, while it is measured and nuanced and there's good differentiation between instruments that are close to you versus instruments that are further back, the way the high mid sits really kind of shapes that feeling of depth. Um, there is more intimacy than usual with uh, certain instruments like vocals and horns and things like that. Um, and the room sounds are a little bit dulled, but you still feel this kind of difference and you still get this um, kind of splayed feeling of depth with the headphones. So it was really interesting feeling of depth, one that I thought was well done and it does create a more emotional impact because you can really hear where instruments are placed in all three dimensions. Overall, the Grado GH3 is lightweight and compact. It has a really nice sense of texture and character and has really nice energy too. There's sort of this playfulness to the way um, transients hit and things like that that makes it a really fun headphone. That said, it's not gonna be for those of you that want realism, um, but more so it'll be for those of you that like a little bit of character and one that's a really aesthetically pleasing sound signature. Thank you so much for watching. For another perspective on the Grado GH3, be sure to check out the description box down below. I've left a link to my colleague's review there. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. And for more videos like this, be sure to subscribe. All right, I will see you next time. Bye.